last week, we came to understand that there is a natural life, and it's a corruptible one. You remember last week's message? 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 to 24 reminds us that the natural life is corruptible, but the spiritual life is incorruptible. Do you see the importance of our Lord Jesus Christ calling us out of the world, which is corruptible, and into himself, which is incorruptible? That's the wonderful thing about coming to know Jesus. You know that you're coming out of what's corrupt, and you're moving into what is incorruptible. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 to 24, my, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. To live with Christ is to live in the incorruptible life, the abundant life, as some might even put it, and knowing that we have an eternal life as well. You know that the eternal life is not just something that's in wait for us. It's something that we've actually entered into. Did you know that? When you gave your life to Christ, that you would be eternally in his presence forevermore. But you know, many Christians only know God intellectually, academically, if you would, and never truly come into his presence here on earth and somewhat in some way still live in that incorruptible life, sorry, living in that corruptible life in some degree. But when we come to experience and encounter God through his Holy Spirit, we begin to understand the presence of God. Have you ever felt the weightiness of God on you? Have you ever felt that on your soul where it felt like it was pressing in? Have you ever felt the, the moving of the Holy Spirit flowing through you from head to toe, coming out of you, coming out of every pore of who you are? Have you ever experienced that? Amen. Amen. You come into the fuller presence of God. But where does he enter? He enters into the wellspring of your life. Someone point there for me, just so I know that you, you know that you've been tracking. Yeah, very good. Right here, your heart. So we have what we call a fleshly heart, right? And we all know what that is. Is there any doctors and nurses here? Anybody? Former doctors and nurses? Presently, there's a few, yeah. It's, it's flesh. What does the heart do? It pumps, right? It pumps blood through your, your body, and, and I, I believe that there's oxygen and whatnot there too, and it's necessary so that your body can live. But we also have a wellspring, which is a spiritual heart, and that is what God put in each and every one of us. It is a spiritual heart. It pumps too but it pumps the blood and the oxygen, the DNA of our Lord Jesus Christ through our being, and it affects our soul, our spirit, and our body. It does all of that. So in, in essence, you have two hearts, one that is for your body, but you have a spiritual heart, one that touches it all. And there is our inner spiritual temple, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. The inner spiritual temple, the wellspring of our heart, the wellspring of our heart, that is where the Lord Jesus entered into your life. He has entered there. And some of you have already said, I've experienced the weightiness. In the Old Testament, the word kavod was used. And that was to feel the, the, the pressure almost, if you would. Almost as if you were having an anxiety attack, but it's God, it's his presence, and you're overwhelmed with it. You're overwhelmed with it. Oh, there's been times I've been so overwhelmed with the presence of God that I was just in tears, and I wasn't sad, I wasn't grieving, I was in joy. It was the presence of God. There's been times that his, his pneuma, the, the Holy Spirit, was just, just flowing through me. And some of you have experienced that. 
The infilling is what the Bible says, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. When I pray, I say, God, continue to fill me. Because when I gave my life to Jesus, the infilling of the Holy Spirit came. But I continue to ask, let it, let it intensify. Let it be more. Give me an extra infilling, if you would, whatever it takes, God. But let your, your, your infilling of your Holy Spirit be magnified in me. Let it be magnified in me. And when the Holy Spirit is magnified in a person, do you know what happens? The incarnation of Christ. The incarnation of Christ. You become the hands and feet and the mouthpiece of Jesus out in the world. And I pray as well for myself, as John did, as Peter did and others did. Oh, Jesus, I need to back up and I need to let you come forward so that when people are in my presence, it is you, it is you that they're experiencing. Can you imagine that? Being with others and they felt as though they were with Christ. That's what it means. When he's truly in your wellspring, your heart is welling up. It's almost as if I'm having anxiety in the moment. And we've all felt anxiety, right? We have. And it feels negative, but I'm talking about a positive feeling here. A positive presence. You can't always call a feeling. Today we look at 1 Peter 2, 4 to 8. And Peter teaches us the importance, the importance of the inner spiritual temple, the importance of obeying the Spirit of God that is in us, that is in that wellspring. Do you know that that wellspring is the inner sanctuary now? Do you know that in the Old Testament, the people used to come to a temple, a building like this, and they had an inner sanctuary in that building, and the only ones that were allowed to go in were the high priest. You and me as common people, even as a pastor, I wouldn't be able to go into that inner sanctuary. It would have to be the bishop of our denomination, the high priest, if you would, that could enter in and be with God. Wow. Think about what Jesus did. He is the high priest, and he entered into you, and he now resides in your wellspring, which is the inner sanctuary of that temple, it's no longer a temple of bricks and wood and mortar and concrete. It is a temple, a fleshly temple. It is a spiritual temple. My body is flesh, but my wellspring is spirit. And the Bible says that God is spirit and that he has put a spirit in each and every one of us, which means that we can connect with God when we've given our spirit to Christ. And when we give our spirit to Christ, our spirit is no longer dead. The Bible says that we were once dead in our trespasses. Our spirit was dead. It was, it was dormant. It wasn't living. That was who we were but who we are today as those that have given their lives to Christ are alive. We are alive. We, we are Christ incarnate. We are the hands and feet, as I said. We go out into the world as people who are alive and we touch those who are dead. And what do we do? Through, through Christ working in us, we bring life to them. <laughs> we bring life to them. We don't do it alone. The power of the Holy Spirit does it. It's tremendous. All because Jesus Christ is in the wellspring of our lives. Wow. Should there be any more days of being grumpy? Should there be any more days of, of being angry? Should there be any more days of being bitterness should there be any more days of malice should there be any more days like that no there shouldn't be but there still is because there's more work yet for the holy spirit to do in the wellspring of our life he's in that sanctuary and he's working on us he's working on us we need to visit him more in that sanctuary would you agree we need to approach him more in that sanctuary would you agree? Yeah. 
Where is that sanctuary? Quick test. It's in you. You are the temple. This beautiful building is a place where the temple of God can come and gather. I love it. But we are the temple. The inner spiritual temple is within us. 1 Peter 2, 4 to 5 says, as you come to him, that's not coming to church today, okay? It's coming to him. In other words, before you even got here today, were you in the inner temple? Were you with God? Because you don't come to a church like this to, to be with God. You come to be with God's people, and the presence of God is here. But it already started in your life. It already started this morning when you got up. Were you or were you not in the temple? The temple is in you. This is a building. We call it the ministry center, just so that you don't get confused. All right? Many of us still have the thought that I got to come to this building to meet with God. They did that in the Old Testament, friends. And in the New Testament, Jesus Christ changed that forevermore. He said, it is now in you. Yes, you still need to gather. It's so important to come and worship. Absolutely it is. But there's a hundred different temples, the same in Christ, coming to worship God. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And if we think otherwise, we're stuck in the old way, in the old, temp, in the old testament. But God has graduated us into a new covenant with Jesus Christ. So as you come to him in this new covenant, the living stone is who Jesus is. He was rejected by human beings, but he was chosen by God and precious to God, to him. And so you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. Am I lying to you or am I telling you the truth? Here it is. You are being built into a spiritual house to be what? A holy priesthood. A holy priesthood. Every one of us is now a minister of the gospel. So why am I the only pastor in this church? I'm not. There's a few others who are recognizing the gifts of pastor. Why am I the only minister of the gospel? I'm not. There's a few others who are recognizing that they too are the ministers of the gospel message. Are you getting what I'm saying? The Holy Spirit has gifted you with hospitality. You use the gift of hospitality to be a minister of the gospel. The Holy Spirit has given you gifts to teach and to preach. The Holy Spirit has given you gifts to administrate. The Holy Spirit has given you gifts to help. We had people helping all over this building here this past week, cleaning it up and doing all that outside work. That's all being ministers of the gospel. But throughout this week, there were many of you who were in your workplaces. There were many of you in your, your home units. There were many of you in your neighborhoods. And you were the hands and the feet and the mouthpiece of Jesus. You were and you are the ministers of the gospel. And you were using your gifts of hospitality all week long. And you were using your gifts of pastoring all week long. And you were blessing people in the name of Jesus. You were praying with people in the workplace. You were praying with people in the neighborhoods. You were discipling people in your own family units. Because that's who you are. You are the children of God, the sons and daughters of the God Most High. You are ministers of the gospel. Do you know who you are? Do you know how much power flows through you? Oh, my goodness. Don't come and ask me for permission to be ministers of the gospel. God has ordained you to be that when you gave your life to Christ. Go and do it. Go and do it and make each other proud in doing so. The wellspring. My heart is welling up. Offering spiritual sacrifices. Verse 5. Offering spiritual sacrifices. Where do we do that? We don't come to a temple to do that. Don't bring me a lamb or a goat unless you want me to eat it, okay? Then I'll, 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 I'll take it from you. But I'm not going to slit its throat and sacrifice it on the altar for you. That's the Old Testament. 
We don't do that anymore. Who is the living sacrifices today? You and I. We are. God gave us the ability to be that. We are offering spiritual sacrifices, which is, God, I know now how you've gifted me, and I'm going to use it to bring glory to you. Offering spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who paid the price for us. And so what Peter is doing here is he's illustrating the difference between the spiritual aspect of bringing sacrifices to the stone temple of Jerusalem and the inner spiritual temple of being born again believers. Do you know who you are? The devil runs when you know who you are. He runs when, he, when you know who you are. It's when you don't, you become apathetic. You become bored. You become complacent. You become lethargic. You feel disenfranchised. You feel disappointed. You feel all these things, but these are all feelings. Feelings that the devil wants you to stay in so that he can make you ineffective as ministers of the gospel because he knows that when Jesus Christ came into you, he came into the wellspring of your life, but he still wants to torment you. He still wants to discourage you. He still wants to to keep you anemic as a minister of the gospel. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to suck the passion and inspiration out of you. And how does he do it? He does it because others aren't following along with you. He does it when... When you feel rejected by people in the world and you become disappointed. He does it when you don't find support in your family units. This is how he does it. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22 says, Consequently, this is who we are. You're no longer foreigners and strangers but you're now fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as that chief cornerstone. And in him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you two are being built together to be I'm a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is a spiritual kingdom that God is building. The Pharisees had such a difficult time with this concept. Oh my goodness. They could not get their brain away from a temple being a building. They just couldn't. And some of us are struggling there too. And we're over 2,000 years removed from that. And we're still stuck there. Do you have to come here to do ministry? Where can it happen? It should happen where you are. Because you are the temple. Do you wait for people to come to you? What does the Bible say? Go. Why do we wait? Why do we still have that concept in our head that if we build it, they will come? (laughs) <laughs> huh? we're commissioned in Matthew 28 to go into all the world making disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them how to obey and we do this with all the nations why? because when we know who we are we know that, that the wellspring of our life has God in it he is in our temple that when we go out he's actually with us It's wonderful to invite people to a church service. Don't get me wrong. But invite them to Christ wherever you are. And then bring them to a gathering. That's what we're supposed to do. But human default is to think different. It's to reject Christ. Maybe you're listening in online today or you're here in person. You're struggling with some of what's being said. And do you know why we default to rejecting Christ? Do you know why we default to not wanting him to be in the wellspring of our life? It's because there's inherited sin from Adam. But I'm not going to use that as an excuse. Yes, we are born into a sinful world, but God allowed his son, Jesus Christ, as I said last week, to all.
born into a sinful world. And he remained sinless. And so what Jesus did was he allowed himself to be sanctified, in other words, to be made holy, to show us what sanctification, to show us what holiness might actually look like in our lives. And that's what last week was all about. There's other reasons why people want to reject Christ. There's that sinful nature. That's us. The devil doesn't make you do it all the time. You know that, right? (laughs) Our bad decisions. Our sinful decisions, we, oh, the devil made me do it. No, no, he doesn't always make you do it. Sometimes you do it. And sometimes I do it. But we have an advocate now, right? We have someone to go to. And where is he? Do you you come here to the church to confess your sins? Because if you're dead, you're going to be disappointed. Because I'm not here to hear those sins. Jesus is. I'll have empathy, and so will you for others. But the advocate is in us. And if you haven't received the Lord Jesus Christ in your life yet, you're going to feel the weight of sin. You're going to feel the darkness. You're going to feel the oppression heavy. But when you give your life to Christ, you can go to him when you've wronged him. And the third thing, the defaulting to why we reject Jesus is because Satan, the enemy of God, blinds us. There is a veil of darkness over people. This is what the Bible says. There is a spiritual deadness, if you would. We all have a spirit. It's, it's worshiping something or someone. Who are you worshiping? Are you worshiping the devil, the world, yourself? For God, you choose. There's a cornerstone. My encouragement to you is to worship Christ. First Peter 2, 64, in Scripture, it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. They will never be put to shame, and here's where we confuse things. We, th- we come to think that this simply means I will never have trouble. That's not what this scripture says. It means that you will never be put to shame. In other words, if you've, if you've given your life to Christ, when you stand before Jesus, you will know him, and he will know you. Why? Because he knew you here in this life. Because you began your relationship with God here. You don't wait till you die and go there. It happens here. This is why he is saying there is a wellspring. Are you inviting me into you, into your life or not? Verse 7 says, Now to you who believe, and to believe means this, to confess with your mouth. Do that with me, friends. Confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart. Touch here. That's the wellspring. He knows whether you've done this or not that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and if you do that, you will be saved. He knows that about you. Now to you who believe that way, this stone, this cornerstone, this Jesus Christ is precious. But to those who do not believe, this is what that stone is. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble. That's for the Jewish person. They would always stumble because they couldn't get past Jesus being the Messiah and starting a new spiritual kingdom in the hearts, in the wellspring of people. They wanted to continue in the ways of the temple being the building, wanted to continue in the ways of you bringing sacrifices to them as if they had the authority. Jesus has the authority. And and Jesus becomes a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Do you believe You know, the Bible says anyone building their spiritual house, their wellspring on Jesus, 
as the chief cornerstone will never regret it. It's a guarantee. Don't take that guarantee from me. Take it from the word of God. You either believe this is authority in your life or you don't. I'm just simply telling you what God said. This is what God said. You will not regret it. But anyone who fails to trust Jesus will be put to shame. They will be put to shame when they stand before God and realize in full that they rejected the truth and the one who is truth. To those rejecting Jesus, God has become the head of the corner. And the cornerstone determined the design and orientation of the building in that day. The cornerstone was the most significant stone in the structure. The cornerstone has now become the capstone. In other words, to those believing Jesus can lift burdens, but to those who reject him, he becomes the judge of their motives and conduct, having the ability to sentence them. And to the one who rejects Jesus, he becomes the final stroke, the final blow the judgment. And to the one who receives Jesus, he becomes their salvation and eternal rest. 2 Corinthians 2.16 says, to the one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. Who is Jesus to you? See the smell of death? Because all you fear is judgment? Or is he the one who is the fragrance of life? You see, that's a perspective we have in in Christendom as well. There are many Christians who believe and feel the judgment of God even as they have come to faith in Jesus. That's all they ever feel. Yes, there's times in our lives when we find ourselves in sin that we feel that way because we have grieved the Holy Spirit of God because we've grieved him and we don't want to grieve the Heavenly Father. We don't want to grieve the Son. We don't want to rain on what Jesus did on the cross and quench it. But there are some who still feel judged and condemned. But what does the Bible say? I want to take us there. It says that condemnation is not from God. If you're feeling condemnation in your life and you've given your life to Christ, you have an oppressor. You have a liar, and he is the liar in this world called Satan that is speaking louder into you than Christ himself and what he did for you. Condemnation is not from God. John 3, 16 to 18 tells us that God sent Jesus to save the world, not to save the earth, although that's not a bad thing for us as human beings to work toward, but that shouldn't be our sole ambition. He came to save the world, in other words, the people of the world. So if there are nearly 8 billion people in this world today, do you think every one of them is important to God? Every single one of them. Absolutely. All created in what? The image of God. All created for what? To worship God. Unfortunately, many of them finding other ways in which they think to worship God that lead to destruction that lead to death. But he came to save the world. But what condemns us is the rejection of the Savior, just like those Pharisees. In other words, eternal death is their final destiny because they rejected Christ's offer of mercy by failing to believe the truth. John three sixteen to 18 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Let this wash over you, family. Let it wash over you. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Did you hear that? If you've professed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believed in your heart that God raised this Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. You are not condemned. You need to believe that starting now. You need to believe it. You need to know who you are because many of you are still walking around as if you were dead and unchanged. And that has to change. Because when we come to faith in Christ, he transforms us into his likeness. We begin to behave like him one day at a time. Our attitude becomes like Christ. 
Our character becomes like Jesus. We begin to model it. Why? Because I said this earlier, the incarnate Jesus is in us. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? (laughs) For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Why? Because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And the Bible tells us that all of us will stand before God one day. And some of us will willingly bow our knee before him in awe, in his glory, in his presence. But that will be a somewhat familiar feeling, if I could even use the word feeling. And I don't even know how that really captures this. When you've already sensed some of God's presence in your life on earth, you will long for more of it. More of it. And what heaven will provide is all of it. (laughs) All of it. We don't experience all of it because we live on this side of heaven. And Satan and his cohorts are still loose. The sinful nature is here. The inherited sin of Adam still is here. But there it won't be. But we can sense and be in the presence of God here. Not in its fullness, but a good taste of it. A good taste of it. Every knee will bow. And some knees will bow almost as if they were forced. They will come to realize their error in that moment. Jesus is precious to those who believe in him. He makes us a living stone in keeping with Christ, the cornerstone. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, Oh, we got a taste of who you are through your son, Jesus. And we have a taste of who you are through your Holy Spirit. But the fullness of who you are, oh, Lord, we long for it. We long for it, Lord, and look forward to the day when we are with you in glory to experience it all. Thank you, Jesus, that you would think that much of us, that you would say, I want you to experience me in the fullness. We praise you for that, Lord. We praise you for that. Father, I just want to pray today that you would forgive us. Forgive us of our selfishness. Forgive us, Lord, when we're disgruntled in our, in our faith. Forgive us, Lord, when we are disappointed in others. Forgive us, Lord, when we are disappointed with you. Move us into a fuller presence of you, God. Fill us to overflow with your Holy Spirit. Jesus, we pray that the wellspring of our hearts would well up with the presence of God and that there would be such a desire in such a passion in us to be the mouthpiece, the hands and the feet of Jesus to a world that is dying without you, Lord. Do they matter to us, those people? Do they matter? I pray that they do. If you're in us, Lord, they matter to you. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Family, you're going to have a great week ahead of you. God is in you, in the inner temple, the wellspring of your life. You are the hands, the feet, and the mouthpiece of Jesus. And I know that you're making a difference wherever you are.